Thank you and welcome to BBC London on tonight's programme. The legal fight to keep LTNs. We meet campaigners who've taken the Tower Hamlet's mayor to court after he tried to scrap them. We know there are older people who feel much safer because there are so many fewer road collisions now in this area. We don't think you listen to people like GPs and hospitals who say that we're much healthier because we're all walking more. Tower Hamlet's mayor says the scheme just pushes traffic to other roads. Also coming up. Two Met officers are facing criminal investigation over a collision last month which killed a heavily pregnant woman and her unborn baby. Plus, 20 new electric buses are rolled out in South London as part of plans to ditch diesel vehicles by 2030. And... Oh! You're green. We assess the wicked effect on London ahead of the film version this week. Hello and good evening to you. We start tonight with an issue that often divides people in the capital and has landed one London borough in court. Low traffic neighbourhoods or LTNs use barriers, bollards and road signs to reduce driver access while still allowing people to walk and cycle in residential areas. Now a decision by the Mayor of Tower Hamlets to remove LTNs in Bethnal Green is being challenged at the High Court by safety campaigners who want it to remain in force. Guy Lynn can tell us more. There's been a battle on the streets of the capital. Protests, even vandalism. All because of efforts to get us to use our cars less. Low traffic neighborhoods or LTNs. Some hate them. Others, like those outside the High Court today, absolutely love them. Those here are opposing a decision to get rid of some LTNs by the Tower Hamlets Mayor. We do not believe that the Mayor complied with his legal duties to listen and consult local residents about what this scheme is actually like in practice. And Jane is one of many who've raised money to come to the High Court to argue that decision by the Mayor was not handled correctly. She lives in one of the LTNs, which is still in place, pending the outcome of what happens at the High Court where bollards and other obstacles restrict traffic in certain areas, meaning those like Jane say, less pollution, less traffic, and a more harmonious living environment. So we've got a situation now where we are safer, but we've really reduced the road collisions. There are almost no serious road collisions now in this area. So people are safer, people are healthier, and people are happier. 3,094 people in Tower Hamlets signed a petition saying he should keep this low traffic neighborhood. Of course, not everyone agrees with Jane and are fully supportive of the Tower Hamlets mayor's decision. There's been controversy over the fines, for example, for anyone driving down the wrong bits of LTNs and that traffic is just pushed elsewhere. You always get winners and you get losers. Those living inside the LTNs benefit. They get the comfort and pleasure of having the quiet roads. But the victims of LTNs who live outside it have more congestion, more pollution for much longer hours. And this cannot be right. This cannot be right. Lufthansa Rahman, the mayor of Tower Hamlets, was elected, he says, on the promise to get rid of LTNs. The council told BBC London they were confident in their legal position and looked forward to the outcome at the High Court. The result will be watched very carefully by other councils. LTNs continue to divide Londoners, and that certainly shows no sign of going away. Guy Lynn, BBC London. Two Metropolitan Police officers are under criminal investigation after a pregnant woman and her baby died in a collision with an unmarked police car. It happened in Eltham last month. Well, our Home Affairs correspondent, Sonia Jessup, has been following the case and is here. And, and Sonia, today we've had more details about what happened that night. That's right. The police watchdog, the IOPC, has been investigating and it says it's established that two unmarked police vehicles have been responding to an unrelated incident that evening in Eltham on the A20 and one of them was involved in a collision with a car driven by a pregnant woman. Now, it says that the preliminary data suggests both police vehicles were using lights and sirens. 
The woman's not been named. We understand that's at the wishes of her family, but we know she was 38 years old and she was at full term in her pregnancy. And sadly, despite being given first aid, neither she nor her baby survived. And Sonia, um, the two police officers are now under criminal investigation. What more can you tell us about that? That's right. The IOPC says that the drivers of both the police vehicles uh, have be, are under criminal investigation for potential driving offences, including causing death by dangerous driving, also under investigation for potential gross misconduct. Um, a third officer, who was a passenger in the police vehicle that was involved in that collision, is under investigation for potential misconduct. Now, this doesn't mean that the officers will face charges or a disciplinary action, but it means that the IPC will complete its investigation, then consider whether to present a file to the Crown Prosecution Service. Now, the watchdog has called this a devastating case. The Met Police says it is uh, assisting with inquiries and its thoughts remain with the family and friends of the woman who died. Yeah, understandably. Uh, Sonia, thank you very much indeed. That's Sonia Jessup, our Home Affairs correspondent. You're watching BBC London, still to come this Wednesday evening. Deep inside my heart you leave me never. I catch up with an R&B boy band from the 90s as Damage mark their 30th anniversary. Now, if you've been out and about in south-east London, you may have caught a glimpse of one of these. They are the capital's newest e-buses and they'll operate on the 358 route between Orpington and Crystal Palace. Transport for London says they'll make London greener and cleaner because they're charged in a different way to conventional electric buses. Chris Legg has been to take a ride on one. Better late than never. It was hoped these buses would be running almost two years ago, but today London's first pantograph charged buses finally hit the streets on the 358 route from Orpington to Crystal Palace. Pantograph technology sees the bus charged by this extending arm making contact with the roof. With opportunity charging through the pantograph here, it means that at the end of the, uh, the routes, both here and at Orpington bus station, um, we can charge the, the buses, give them a little top up, which means that they don't have to go back to the depot during the day, which means we need fewer buses and we can manage the long journey, 15 miles between Crystal Palace and Orpington. Isaac is one of the first drivers to take to the wheel. Safety wise, I'll say this is one of the top buses I've driven and I've driven a few buses since 2009. So I can say confidently that this is one of the best. As soon as you come off the, uh, the gas pedal, it slows down. So it won't just roll away or take off. So yeah, that's the difference. It's really good. And so with the rest of the media, we set off on one of the first pantograph powered trips through the capital. So what's it like being a passenger on one of these buses? Well, I won't lie. It feels very much like being on any other bus. Um, TfL says it's been designed with safety in mind, that the seats are going to reduce accidents, that there's a non-slip floor. But I do think uh, this is going to be what's going to go down best with all passengers' USB charging points. Also on board, local MP Liam Conlon. It's fantastic. I mean, look, it's, it's light and bright. This is all well and good, but a constituent's telling you that TfL should be doing more on other routes to maintain and improve services? I think if we've now got this bus, I think more of this on other routes will be really welcomed. One of the things that constituents talk to me about all the time is they want cleaner air, they want to tackle air pollution. The Mayor of London is really serious about that and this is another step that he's taken today that will be welcomed by constituents. Launch day didn't go entirely smoothly. One bus, not this one, was unable to go into service after the charging arm failed to connect. TfL says that was a teething problem caused by driver error and remains confident in the new technology. Chris Slegg, BBC London. Let me bring you a roundup now of some of the day's other news. Two Metropolitan Police officers have appeared in court to deny sexually assaulting a woman in a casino while they were off duty. PCs Jerome Beasley, who's 42, and Luke Robinson, who's 39, both face four charges. They're currently suspended. 
Two people have been taken to hospital after a bus roof was ripped off after a collision with a tree in Dagenham. It happened at Hedgeman's Road this morning. Police say two women were taken to hospital and their injuries are not life-threatening. An investigation into the cause of the crash is underway. The Essex car giant Ford says it's hoping to avoid any compulsory redundancies after announcing the loss of 800 jobs in the UK over the next three years. A number of posts at the Research and Development Centre at Dunton near Basildon could be under threat. The firm says the cuts will be in administrative and development roles rather than production. And the operator of the Elizabeth line has lost its bid to renew its contract. From next May, it'll be run by a consortium that includes the Tokyo Metro and the company that already runs Southern and Thameslink. TfL says it'll bring the best parts of Tokyo and London to the Elizabeth line. Now, we're going to take you back to the 90s and a London R&B boy band called Damage. This was one of their big hits. Inside my heart you leave me never even Well, Jade, Andre, Noel and Russ are currently on a UK tour marking their 30th anniversary, playing in London this Friday. A little earlier, they came into the studio to have a chat with me. Hi, guys. Great Hello. to have you. Hello. Hi. What was it like seeing yourselves back, your debut on Top of the Pops, 1996? It's quite nostalgic, right? Yeah. It's quite strange watching that back, yeah. but fun. Like, it's great memories, great memories for sure. I've done a little bit of a cheesy look to the camera, then <laughs> I'm a little bit embarrassed about it. But yeah, it was the time. It was the time. It was what was required. Time it was yeah. the time. Yeah. 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 No ear grabs, though. <laughs> now, we know that the 90s and the noughties were seen as the golden era of boy bands. What was it like? Like being compared or being up against people like, you know, Take That, Boyzone, Westlife. I think we mm. always, so we were inspired by people like SWV, Boys to Men, Jodeci, um, Jackson, Jackson Pasadena's. You know, Pasadena's. So for us, we always kind of had our own niche within that space. Mm. Um, but among the likes of Take That, Boyzone, 9115, I think Damage always stood out for the R&B sound that we had, yeah. Yeah, especially when you think about tracks like Ghetto Romance. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That was a, you know, one of our biggest hits. BBC Two doc, uh, you know, boy bands forever. We've heard how you know young boys thrust into the limelight and in many ways not prepared for stardom. Mm. Is that how you guys felt? Mm. I don't think no. I, I, we our journey was a lot different from all the other yeah. boy bands. Mm. You know, we 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 were self-made. Yeah. You know, we we rehearsed. We did our due diligence. You know, we we like rehearsed together from a young young age and. Um, we put ourselves together, so that set us apart from everybody else. For and we, we didn't have that big machine behind us to push us. We were like, yeah. we signed to an independent, so it was all about, like Jade said, the hard work. Not that the other bands didn't put in the hard work, but oh, obviously yeah. our journey, like Jade said, is, was a little Very bit different. different. Yeah. Now, also, I should say, you have gone on to do different things, haven't you? Yeah. Just tell us about that. Yeah. Oh, so I, I work with, I work for a charity called the Carers Trust, which is amazing, looking after young carers. So yeah. um, I've been doing youth work for plus 20 years. So I, I'm still working with young people, which is amazing. I've been chefing and other things like property management and development and stuff. So I went on to become a criminologist, sociologist, organizational consultant. And I yeah. do photography and also work in the education sector as well. Yeah. Yeah. All, all whilst still all doing whilst performing. damage stuff, yeah. which is amazing. <laughs> I Londoners, mm. it must feel very special playing to a London crowd. What is that feeling like? Mm, it's a great feeling. It, yeah, it's really special. It's, it's coming home. These are the people that really kind of supported us from the beginning, looking out, seeing our wives, our children, and people that have been on the journey for three decades. It's really special. Here you are, you know, back on stage again <laughs> mm -hmm. as yeah. men. Yes, not boys, yes. Boys, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I did there. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> 
Does it still feel as good, or are there a few more aches and pains? There the definitely there? a few more aches and pains. <laughs> the knees, the knees stretch. You know, we have to warm up the body, the vocals, <laughs> whereas before we just go on stage and just enjoy it. And we're still enjoying ourselves, and we're still doing the absolute most. Yeah. Like, you come to a damage performance, and it will be like we're taking you back to 1996, 97. Definitely. That's an absolute promise. But yes, the warm up is necessary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the ride is just fruit and water. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Still sprightly, though. Well, from boy bands to what's anticipated to be one of the biggest film hits of the year. However, before Wicked hit cinema screens, it was a hugely successful theatre adaptation in the West End, of course. In fact, it's one of London's longest-running productions and recently surpassed its 7,000th performance. Uh, to mark the movie's arrival, even Greenwich has been renamed... Greenwich in honour of one of the main characters. Well, our reporter, Matt Graveling, can tell us more. And a warning, there are some flashing images in Greenwich tonight. Matt. There are, yes, we're going to meet the Green Witch of Greenwich, Cynthia Revo, in just a few moments. But about three minutes ago, she actually just illuminated the Greenwich Observatory behind me. Green, of course, with her co-stars from the Wicked movie. She also illuminated the Meridian Line, splitting the sky into east and west. So as we look to the western sky, why don't you have a little watch of this report about the show, which has been spellbinding people in London for almost two decades. At its heart, it's a story shining light on self-confidence and sisterhood. But long before the movies decided to go green, London has been home to the stage musical, captivating millions. This is my 18th time at Wicked. I just love the story. I love the costumes and music. We saw Hamilton back in the summer and we've seen Le Mis and, you know, um, Phantom and all the other shows. So this was on the list still to be ticked off. Wicked has been on here at the Apollo since the 27th of September 2006. It's the origin story of the Wicked Witch of the West from the Wizard of Oz. And it's now hoped that the film may add to the stage show's success. The long running shows are really vital to the vibrancy of the West End. They're the thing that often brings people in for the first time, um, but hopefully it also sparks an interest in London theatre more generally. So you maybe next time you'll come and see something that isn't quite as well known, but could still bring you a huge amount of joy and entertainment. On Friday, the Apollo Theatre celebrated its 7,000th show. As a result, it has now been seen by over 12 million people in the West End alone and it's the 10th longest running production in the West End, having been extended for a 38th time. As a result, it's now taking bookings until January 2026. Where Wicked in London has been particularly groundbreaking is, uh, again, the casting. Uh, Louise Dearman, for instance, was the first actress ever to play Glinda and then Elphaba. Uh, they had the first black uh, Elphaba, uh, casting and and that's really important to making theatre so much more accessible. So after 18 years at the Apollo and a new film out on Friday, Wicked looks set to continue defying gravity and expectation. Well, I'm delighted to be joined by. The witch herself, minus <laughs> the green makeup, it's yes, got to be is. said. Uh, thank you for having us here, and you've just illuminated the Royal Observatory green. <laughs> oh, of wonderful. course, all about this movie. But the show came first, mm -hmm. and we've been enjoying it here in the capital for so long now. What's the secret? Why do you think it's been so well received for two decades almost? Well, I think it's the story. I think uh, this story about these two women and their friendship. It sort of moves people, and the story about a person who feels a little bit outside of the, the norm um, it, and is, ends up celebrating and ends up, you know, finding her power is a, is a thing to celebrate. I think that's why it keeps going, yeah. And the songs and the, the fun that you can have, and it's good for everyone, yeah. Now, we won't give any spoilers away, but um, for people who have seen the show, they'll know a bit about the film. Of course, it follows a, a young witch as she grows up. Now, yes. As a lady who grew up in this part of the world, yeah. in, in London, yeah. 
Did you take any of your own upbringing uh, into this role, into the characters, especially some of the struggles that the young people do face? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I've always felt a little bit odd and a little bit outside of the norm, and I think I took that with me and, and tried to infuse the character with it. And I think just like finding my own voice and finding out who I was is definitely um, helpful to, to playing this character. The show itself has, has diversified, hasn't it, over the years? Um, we spoke to a critic earlier who said that is very much the, the secret of the, of the success. Do you think that's why it's done so well on the West End? I think so. I think you get a myriad of different people playing the, the roles and you, you get different points of view. And I think as long as you can keep changing and keep showing the different points of view, you'll always get something that grows. Yeah. I get to speak to a lot of artists, and whether it's a, a musician making an album or an actor or an actress making a film, mm -hmm. Once it's out there, it's out there, yes, right? Yes, uh, yes. Your family and yourself saw it at the yes. premiere. Yeah. What's the verdict? Uh, very, very happy. My mom saw it for the first time this week, and she cried her eyes out, so that was great. And my sister said she, it was phenomenal. So that's high praise from both of them, yeah. And I've great. been asked by some people in my office, yes. uh, as someone from London, yeah. broomstick or tube? Oh, broomstick always. I've got to agree with that. <laughs> Cynthia, thank you so much. And if there's one spell you could cast, can you please make it a little bit warmer? I'll because try it's... my very, very best. I, I should have done that before I got here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> know, we've turned the whole place turn green. green. I'm turning now blue here, turn Cynthia. <laughs> well, we need to get you inside and get you some hot chocolate, I think. Hot chocolate with the witch. That is what I'm talking about. The movie comes out officially on Friday the 22nd. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks to you both. Yeah, definitely go and warm up. Uh, Matt Graveling there talking to Londoner and star Cynthia Arrivo. <laughs> Meanwhile, another star of the film surprised passengers at a London station earlier with an impromptu piano performance. Hollywood star Jeff Goldblum entertained crowds at St Pancras International. He plays the role of the Wizard of Oz in Wicked and spoke to our reporter, Lakshmi Gopal. I fell in love with England and London. I've done a lot of movies here. I've done plays here in your beautiful theatres. Um, and, of course, we made this whole movie here. We were at Sky Studios in Elstree, you know, and had the greatest time. The crews, the craftspeople here were... Or the cream of the crop, just top notch, couldn't be nicer. I, I love it here very much. Well, you know, London loves you because there was that 25 foot statue of you near Tower Bridge <laughs> six years ago. I know. How about that? Uh, I, that was a uh, 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 that was a fun, funny. <laughs> That was uh, Jeff Goldblum. Uh, it's all about purple today. Uh, a delicate heathland plant could return to one of the UK's ancient woodlands as part of a new conservation project. Bell heather is believed to have disappeared from Epping Forest in the 1960s and it now only survives in Essex in one area near Colchester. Conservationists are now starting to reintroduce the plant by transplanting root cuttings 30 miles down the road. Layla Hayes has the story. Its bell-shaped flower creates a stunning purple patchwork. And now, thanks to a new conservation project, Bell Heather is returning to Epping Forest after more than 50 years. Until the 1960s, Bell Heather used to thrive here in Epping Forest. After that, it simply vanished. It's hoped this project will return the purple flower to its former glory. It's all the brainchild of botanist Paul Fletcher, who took root cuttings from Tiptree Heath in Essex and planted them back into the forest in Epping, which has exactly the dry, free-draining soil it needs to grow. Hopefully having a, a plant like bell heather will put a, a focus on um, maintaining heathland a bit more and how important it is for biodiversity. Plus, it looks pretty. <laughs> Other types of heather thrive on heathland in the southeast, but bell heather can be trickier to find. It's hoped this collaboration between the City of London Corporation and the Essex Wildlife Trust means here in Epping the plants will soon be back. Across the UK, we've lost about 80% of heather since the 1800s. And so maintaining these areas of heathland is, is really important and ensuring that we've got the variety of species. So incorporating bell heather back into the heathland is improving that diversity. The plants will now be carefully checked every week until spring. 
restoring the once lost bell heather to Epping Forest for generations to come. Leila Hayes, BBC London. Right, let's see what's going on with the weather. Chris has joined us and after the snow flurries and the rain yesterday, I think dry and crisp is how I'm describing today. Yeah. Matt was saying it was cold. Yeah, <laughs> he you looked know, it. <laughs> yesterday I was on the bike uh, coming into work for, across London and uh, started off chucking it down rain, really cold. I thought, is that a bit of sleet hitting me? Yes. And then it turned snow, massive flakes. Did you see them? I did. So I wasn't out on a bike, I have to say. <laughs> I was regretting my choice of <laughs> life as well. Flakes were really big, actually, because with temperatures close to freezing, you get flakes sticking together, which makes them really big. So that's when you know that the air's kind of really marginal for snow. Today, though, we've had skies like these, plenty of sunshine around, and yes, it has been cold. How cold? Well, today we saw temperatures reach the giddy heights of five degrees Celsius. Average of this time of the year is 11. Five would be cold even for a January day. So, yes, it has been pretty cold out there. And overnight tonight, with clear skies, light winds, it's going to be a similar night to we've seen over the last few nights. A bit of high cloud coming up from the south. It's not going to do anything from stopping those temperatures plunging. And I think in the countryside, we could get down to about minus five tomorrow morning in the very coldest spots. Now, tomorrow, we've got this area of low pressure that's going to be diving into France. Now, we're in the cold air on the cold side of it. Very heavy snow for France with this one. Very strong winds as well. So there will be some disruption there. The precipitation from this weather front gets really close to us. I reckon it could just come in across the downs. And if that happens, you might actually see a centimetre or two into parts of Sussex for anyone travelling that way. But I think it will stay away from London. We'll just see a bit of high cloud coming across the sky. And that's just the leading edge of that weather front moving in. So the sunshine a bit hazy, temperatures a bit low, four or five degrees Celsius. The map green, uh, just like the uh, Wicked musical there. On into uh, Friday's weather charts, probably more in the way of sunshine around, but it's not going to do anything for the temperatures after a cold, frosty start to the day. Still with the risk of a few icy patches, our temperatures are going to stay well below freezing. Now, as we head into the weekend that we see something of a change in our weather patterns, it will eventually turn milder for sure, but this weather system may well become a named storm. It's going to bring some very strong winds into the Irish Sea, and very heavy snow into some of the hills of northern England and Scotland. Could get a few flakes of snow over the Chilterns just as this starts to move in. But otherwise, it's outbreaks of rain that works in. It turns quite windy. And look at these temperatures. We're back up at around 12 or 13 degrees above average for the time of year. And that really heralds a real change in our weather fortunes. Second half of the weekend, still low pressure. The same one with us. So further outbreaks of rain, still quite windy. That eventually clears through. And the next day, you should see some decent sunshine. Put it on the calendar. That'll be Tuesday. Riz. OK, Chris, thanks ever so much. And that is where we leave you. So thanks very much for watching. You know you can get the latest on the day's news stories on our website, bbc.co.uk slash London and other features there too, including a former EastEnders actor talking about how his love of painting and art helped him through depression. Plus, check out the new names and colours of London's six overground lines from me and all the team here. Whatever you're up to, have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>